Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Tom Dusterberg, a senior fellow at the Hudson Institute and a member of the advisory board of the Manufacturing Policy Initiative of the School of Public Environmental Affairs at Indiana University. Um, I'm pleased to uh, introduce this uh, session. This is the third session of a four-part series during Manufacturing Week, uh, featuring uh, some of the nation's leading experts to uh, give their views on what we need to do to strengthen U.S. manufacturing. Uh, today's session will um, focus on the resilience of the manufacturing sector. Um, there is a background paper uh, co-authored by one of our panelists today, Keith Belton, and a senior fellow at um, MPI, Mike Mandel, and myself, which is available on the MPI website. It's my Great pleasure to introduce the moderator for today's session, uh, Stephen Gold, who is the president and CEO of the Manufacturers Alliance for Productivity and Innovation. Steve has a long career in manufacturing, uh, notably at the uh, National Association of Manufacturers, where he was the executive director of the Campaign for the Future of U.S. Manufacturing. He's also a, a regular columnist for Industry Week he has a JD from George Mason University and a master's from George Washington University. So Stephen, we'll turn things over to you and uh, we're looking forward to a great session. Thank you very much, Tom. Uh, and thanks to the Hudson Institute uh, and Indiana University's uh, Manufacturing Policy Initiative for hosting this session on manufacturing resilience. So we have quite the distinguished panel uh, gathered here with you know, unique perspectives on the subject at hand. Let me just open with this observation. Um, U.S. manufacturing seems to be, have reached an inflection point. It was picking up speed in terms of digital transformation, and then the pandemic struck, and you got demand plummeted uh, across the board. Many factories were forced to close. Supply chains were significantly disrupted, uh, and coming out of the crisis, I think we find some trends are accelerating, like automation, and we may hear about that in a in a bit, but other trends are seeing the opposite effect, like globalization, where the brakes seem to have slammed a little. Um, so it's anybody's guess when the demand and the output in various subsectors of manufacturing are going to reach pre-COVID levels. So the subject of manufacturing resilience and how policymakers can help is very, very timely right now. The format we'll follow here is that I'll introduce each of our panelists and ask them to provide their unique perspective on the topic of manufacturing resilience. And each panelist is gonna talk about eight minutes and then we'll turn to a QA and a panel discussion. And so without further ado, let me go ahead and get um, this started. I'm gonna each introduce them uh, one at a time and we're gonna start with Keith Belton. He, Keith uh, is the co-author of Policies to Enhance the Resilience of US Manufacturing. As Tom said, along with Mike Mandel and Tom Dusterberg. Uh, and Keith is uh, the principal at the Pareto Policy Solutions. He's former director of the Manufacturing Policy Initiative, uh, a senior fellow there. And Keith is author of that report. Why don't you kick off the program with an overview of your findings and your policy recommendations? Well, thanks, Stephen. Um, I'll do just that. Um, I think I'll just start by reiterating a point you made that the COVID-19 pandemic has focused attention on the fragility of global value chains. Uh, surveys of U.S. manufacturers indicate supply chain disruptions throughout the spring and summer months, uh, which leads to a question, what can government do to strengthen uh, U.S. supply chains? And this is a question that Tom Dusterberg and Michael Mandel and I wrestled with this summer when we did some research, made some recommendations, and wrote a paper that's now publicly available. Um, we focused on the concept of resilience, and I think it's important to have a definition. Our definition was a manufacturing sector that can adjust in real time to a supply disruption that may occur anywhere and minimize any loss to U.S. customers. So we then identified four components of resilience, which we borrowed from the business management literature. And I wanna talk briefly about each of those four components and our recommendations under each. Uh, the first is re-engineering. So although the risk of supply chain disruption can never be completely eliminated, it can be lowered or minimized through re-engineering. 
So re-engineering includes reshoring capabilities we may have lost over time. It includes attracting foreign direct investment. And it includes investing in R&D to support new products or processes. Re-engineering can make supply chains shorter and simpler to serve regional markets. One recommendation we make under re-engineering is for government to develop a stress test that manufacturers could use to identify their own supply chain vulnerabilities. Another is for the government to employ certain criteria to prioritize among reshoring projects. Now, the second component of resilience is collaboration. And collaboration involves all entities along a value chain, and it includes uh, intelligence gathering, it would include planning, it would include changes to the production process. Uh, the government can reduce the cost of such collaboration through trade agreements and regulatory cooperation by aligning economic development incentives through information sharing or through subsidies or tax breaks. One recommendation that we make is for the government to invest more in collaborative, pre-competitive R&D involving industry, academia, and government. Such collaboration has been remarkably successful in promoting breakthrough innovation. We think the Manufacturing USA program, uh, which is an example of collaborative, pre-competitive R&D, should be expanded. Another recommendation we make is for the US and its allies to jointly subsidize production of goods that are critical to national security, such as the processing of rare earth oxide enjoys a global monopoly due to massive state subsidies and lax environmental standards. Um, a third component of resilience is risk management or governance. So the risk management culture of a firm would include top-down oversight and rules to reduce supply chain risk. Uh, government can facilitate the risk management culture of firms by focusing attention on issues of national importance. For example, the government could periodically identify critical supply chains at highest risk of disruption. Government could also give itself new authority to intervene in markets during a major supply chain disruption. For example, based on our COVID-19 experience in the United States, Congress could amend the Defense Production Act or the National Stockpile Act to better respond to a future supply shock. And there are several pieces of legislation in Congress that would do just that. Um, and the final component of resilience is agility. So agility refers to visibility, being able to see things sooner, and, and includes velocity, being able to respond more quickly. So agility relates to the number of options available to a firm to respond to an event. Uh, agile supply chains are not locked into only one option. So it would include flexible production technologies at the factory level. Uh, it would include smart manufacturing across a value chain. Uh, one of our recommendations here is for the government to modernize our infrastructure and to facil facilitate the movement of manufactured goods. Such investment would certainly ensure reliable delivery times and minimize fleet maintenance costs. So thus far, I've mentioned just seven of our 15 recommendations in our paper. Um, other recommendations include reforming the WTO to facilitate trade and rules-based trade. Um, and we also want to uh, recommend establishing a manufacturing czar for the United States and develop a national strategic plan to really coordinate various programs across the federal government. But when we look back across all 15 of our recommendations, we really draw three major conclusions. First, there's no single governmental action that will ensure resilience across the board. Governmental actions are needed to address each component of resilience, as I've already described. Two, there are significant co-benefits to policies that enhance resilience. These include improved competitiveness and greater sustainability. For example, modernizing infrastructure will enhance U.S. competitiveness and make us a more attractive place for manufacturing investment. And three, nurturing future capabilities is easier than restoring capabilities where other nations enjoy a comparative advantage. We are more likely to win a race when we are not starting from behind. So more details on all of this can be found in our paper uh, that we wrote, and it is publicly available through the webpage of the Manufacturing Policy Initiative at Indiana University. Um, and I think I will just stop there and thank you. Great, Keith. Thank you very much. And what we'll do is we'll come back to you, obviously, uh, with some questions afterwards. But 
let's go ahead and turn to our second panelist, Gary Johnson. Uh, Gary uh, is the Chief Manufacturing and Labor Relations Officer at Ford Motor Company. Uh, in this role, Gary oversees the global operations of every Ford assembly, stamping, and powertrain plant across the world, as well as Ford's labor affairs organizations and a lot of other responsibilities. <laughs> and Gary, you're in a position to see, so to speak, the underbelly of auto manufacturing global supply chains. Can you provide some insights into you know, supply chain weaknesses and what the auto industry and I guess more broadly speaking, the manufacturing sector needs to do to create increased resilience? Yeah, I mean, Stephen, thank you. And this is the perfect test case this year about resilience, what we've been through. And as I reflect back on, you know, we're going our 10th month of this uh, virus. We started seeing this come in China the second week of January and we kicked off our merger response group. And it originally started with what was happening in China and then how that supply base based out of China and there's thousands for us and other automotive companies was gonna support North America and also for to Europe. And as you got into the middle part of February, it started to get critical. Uh, we started to see shortages. We were troubled to get uh, material out of China through the ports, airplane flights, everything started to slow down uh, to be a major concern for us. And then as the virus kind of spread into Europe, it became obvious that we had to do something different here to protect our, our companies and our employees. So one of the key things we did was we created a return to work playbook to support the virus. And that includes all the safety protocols, um, what we're doing from daily self-validation, temperature scans. Uh, we went into cleaning protocols, uh, major differences, how frequently we're doing that. Uh, close contact tracing and obviously masks for everybody in our system. And one of the things we did in that process is we shut down the middle of March here in North America. We created a joint task force with the UAW and the big three. And later on, Toyota and Honda joined us. And we started sharing that protocols and that process, we created a joint playbook. But more importantly, we started putting that in supply base. Because obviously we were, a, we're a big organization, we have a lot of resources to pull this together. Uh, and as we locked, started working through the supply base as we shut down, it started to become a global issue for suppliers to support us, tier ones all the way through tier fours. So that, that task force continued to work together. We went live, shared with all our key suppliers, GM and SCA and Toyota and Honda did the same thing. And in the middle of that, uh, the resilience part, Stephen, which was critical for us, is then we kicked off what we call Project Apollo, and GM and FCA did the same thing, is how do we create first responder equipment, and how as a company, with that resilience we took on, we kicked off uh, ventilators, uh, masks, shields, within about two and a half weeks. We've already built 100 million masks, about 50 million shields, and we just completed our 50, 52,000 uh, ventilator requirement to the government. All while, all while our plants were shut down between eight and 10 weeks here in the US, North America, Europe was already down, and that was the backside of China starting to think about coming back up. So it was kind of incredible the work we were going through with our supply base support us in that first responder aspect, and then how they were gonna be able to come back up as we reached into the middle of May. So China had come back up in May, um, then Ford of Europe came back up for us in the, in the European operations. And then here in North America, basically all the big automotive companies and all the suppliers for the first time in history started all back up the same week, which is unheard of, right? I have, my team has 33 plants here in North America. You think between GM, Chrysler and us, there's 70, 75 plants, all the tier one through the tier fours coming up. And those first few weeks were really, really difficult from a supply base and resilience for them to survive. Um, and then as we kind of went through that, we started learning more about certain situations with government interaction when the, the CARE Act came out and how that affected our attendance at our plants, people having issues with their children, being at home, uh, taking care of parents, other people who gotten sick or had the virus. And that really started to impact the industry in us at first, and we had a lot of temporary employees come in, we have uh, almost double what we've ever had in our history when our, our joint partners at UAW, but the supply base couldn't keep up. They couldn't get enough people. Uh, they were struggling with the, the protocols, uh, having high attendance issues. So we struggled during the June, July timeframe, having some shutdowns and ability to you know, provide our volume. And then we were going through that whole process. The other thing we learned 
is this virus is going to be with us for another a long time. So we're in the middle of July. We've had we're meeting with specialists across the world, special doctors, uh, advising us what we need to do from a protocol perspective. You know, everybody in my plants has mask on, and I try to reflect and tell people what it's like to wear a mask in a plant is basically being a treadmill going at 3.2 miles an hour. It's 85 degrees. You got a mask on, and do that for 10 hours and take 75 minutes of break. And if you can survive that, you can figure out what our employees are doing in our plants and also what's happening in our supply base. We created some really cool data analytics, um, and we were communicating with our employees. Our supply base is doing the same thing, that they were safer being in our plants than being home in communities. We have data now that can tell you death rates, virus issues, hospitalization by community, by county, where our plants are located globally. And our rates are way lower than what's actually happened in, in the U.S., for example, in almost every community. We also created contact tracing, and we had to share that with the industry. We were about 2.1 a close context where everybody was tested positive, now we're down to less than one, as you see that rate continue to go. So some incredible things we've seen uh, as part of that evolution through the month of August going to September. We're continuing to meet four times a week with our leadership team, our CEO and chairman of the company. Um, and what we're seeing now is Mexico is still struggling. The supply base in Mexico, some of our plants are still struggling. They're not at 100% even back yet. Um, and they're struggling with that distribution. And what we're also seeing is the ability for our transportation industry, specifically here in U.S., Canada, Mexico, to keep up with the demand. It's the highest level of number of trailers per driver that we've seen in the last three years. The average number of trailers is 5.2 for every driver. And as you go in the holiday season, November and December with Amazon and everything else, we project it to get worse. It means suppliers have to do premium freight, and we are running, and, and, and Stephen, you mentioned this, the demand is way higher than we expected. Uh, so we are running really heavy overtime. Uh, we're in a transition for us in some of our major launches. So we built up some inventory. Uh, used cars have really started to clear out. We thought that was going to be a big deal for the industry. Uh, but you'll see third quarter, we've been running really, really hard, and supply base is barely hanging on, and that premium freight continues to evolve. So. For us, the volume is, is, is stable over time in our plans. Uh, but now we're starting to look at this pandemic and this virus, and there's resilience to our industry for at least another year. And we look at um, what we have internally in our company, about only 18% of the people take flu shots. So how many people are going to take vaccines? How do we make that as part of the process? Uh, and what do they do as they go through the struggle of the winter? So. Uh, you know, I, I'm just amazed. I've been in the company for 34 years. I've never seen an industry come up all the same time, same time and continue to hold it together. We're running about 99% uptime, which is our rate per day, uh, which is incredible numbers, pretty much what we were before the virus. And, and this is going to be a long journey. And, and we continue to work together with our governments and our supply base and our leadership team uh, to continue to support the industry. So, Stephen, that's where we're at, and that's kind of really uh, – a reflection on the last 10 months of incredible resilience as an industry and us as a company and what our teams have been doing. And thank you. That's excellent. Yeah, you guys really are leading the charge uh, for all of manufacturing. So uh, good work there. And uh, I am getting my flu shot today. So <laughs> um, our next guest speaker, Rosemary Gibson. Uh, Rosemary is the senior advisor at the, the Hastings uh, Center, which is involved in bioethics, very much involved in bioethics. And She's the author of the 2018 book, China Rx, Exposing the Risks of America's Dependence on China for Medicine, which exposes America's over-reliance on China for essential medicines. And Rosemary, you were so prescient, weren't you? I mean, this over-reliance rose up to bite us this year, and it's so reminiscent of, of, the, of the rare earth minerals debate that arose over the past decade. So can we hear your perspective on the fragility of our supply chain and policies we might look to uh, to increase the resilience of, of manufacturing. Well, Steve, thank you very much. Uh, it's great to be with uh, this panel today. Uh, yeah, we've seen from coronavirus that this was absolutely predictable, that uh, the products that we needed that are essential for life, essential medicines, we heard from Gary talking about uh, masks, gowns, and gloves, that we, our global supply chain for these products is highly centralized, especially for 
in the case of medicines, core components to make them. So we've learned a lot from the coronavirus and hopefully for the next event that happens, whether it's a natural disaster or next pandemic, we'll be better prepared. I'd like to cover just a, a couple of points. One is on the supply side. I also want to highlight that uh, in this particular subsector of essential drugs, that quality matters, that every pill, every vial of medicine has to be made exactly right. And in the middle of a pandemic with surge demand, that can be very much a challenge. And third, I want to address cost. And then finally, uh, what can government and the private sector do together? So just on the supply chain, what we learned from the pandemic is we had more than 100 countries that had people with this coronavirus who were hospitalized, who were sick, and they need basic medicines. These are the medicines that you, if you go into any hospital here in the US, this is what ICUs and emergency rooms use every day. They're basic generic drugs. Most of our drugs are generics. These have become commodity products. And it turns out these are the same ones you need to help people recover who are hospitalized with coronavirus. So you need sedatives when people are on ventilators. You need antibiotics if they get a secondary infection and, and so much more. And so at the beginning of the outbreak in early February, I was sitting with a group of pharmaceutical engineers. These are the people who are in the plants every day making product. And we were having dinner and sitting around the table and I went around the room and I said, okay, let's take these 10 critical drugs that are needed to care for people with coronavirus. Where the starting materials come, the core chemicals. And each of them said 90% of the chemicals for those essential drugs are sourced in a single country in China. So we had hundred, more than 100 countries competing for drugs that need these core chemicals and other ingredients. The other thing that we learned, and when you have products that are essential for life, governments will ban exports to make sure they have enough for their own people. So we had 75 countries, including half of EU firms, countries, and the EU makes med uh, components and medicines and finished drugs, and the UK, they banned exports of medicines and supplies. So even our, our friends, that they may want to help us, but they realize that they have to take care of their family, their country family first. And so when we talk about resilience, there's increasing conversation about those things that are essential for life, essential to care for people to help them recover, is part of resilience having some domestic manufacturing capacity here to start up um, quickly and maybe to have it um, a manufacturing in the best of times here to ensure we have what we need when we need it. So that's the, that's the supply side. I wanna turn now to the quality side. You know, when we go into a retail pharmacy to, to get a prescription or have it mailed to us, what it, I, I've developed a great respect for what it takes to make every pill, every vial of medicine absolutely the right way for every person every time. So these are regulated products by the Food and Drug Administration. And the FDA has developed the gold standard of what it takes to do inspections of manufacturing facilities. There's a process of, called GMP, Good Manufacturing Practices. And so the FDA is in plants um, in normal times conducting those inspections. What happened during the pandemic is to protect federal employees who would travel the world is they recalled all their inspectors. They're just uh, starting up inspections here in the US plants, which can go for two weeks. These are very intensive activities. But in other countries uh, such as China, those inspectors are not there. The FDA had already was having problems getting uh, federal employees to want to travel there to do inspections uh, prior to COVID. And I, as I, I predicted in China, RX, as you said, that we could have this situation of shortages during a pandemic. But I also predicted that we're beginning to see the end of the ability of the FDA to protect the American people from substandard uh, drugs and products. And we certainly saw that with you know, testing kits that didn't work, giving false readings, gowns that were contaminated, masks that were not, did not meet uh, OSHA standards. So we have to think not just about the manufacturing side, but also the quality side, because that's essential for, for life and death. And just finally on the cost side, 
Um, I learned a lot in writing China RX about when we go to the drugstore, where does our money go? So I'll give you a, a quick example from a, a pharmaceutical engineer who's, he's had more than 35 years experience. And he tells a story of going to a, a local drugstore to pick up his prescription for a blood pressure medicine. It's called lisinopril. A lot of people take it. It's a generic, a commodity product. And the price was $157.50 for a 90 day supply. And he said to me, guess how much the manufacturer gets paid? I thought, well, maybe 20 bucks. I'd love, if we had a chance, I would do a poll just to see what everybody, he said the manufacturer would get paid a dollar. So when we talk about reshoring and what does it cost to make things here? I think it, it helps to have some transparency on where does the money go uh, when we buy a, a basic generic drug? And uh, is there a possibility to really ramp up domestic manufacturing by reclaiming more of the value in what we uh, spend on these basic commodity drugs? So that's just a point about cost. It doesn't have to cost more, that much more to make them. We just have to look at the whole cost structure and where that money's going. And it would be great if more of that money could going into high value uh, manufacturing from redundant supply chains and, and quality. That's where our money really should be going. And I think transparency on that front would be great. I wanna turn briefly now to what uh, government was doing in the course of this pandemic. This is happening in real time. We do have a strategic national stockpile, but it's important for everybody to know that that stockpile was not set up to, to refill the entire, entire commercial supply chain. It was only set up and designed to support localized events like a Hurricane Sandy or Hurricane Maria. So here we have a global pandemic and yes, we were not prepared and we haven't been prepared for years. I document in China RX, we, we can't make antibiotics anymore in the United States. That's a huge risk to our health security and national security. That's been going on for 20 years. So we have a long history here of how we got to this, to this point. But uh, we saw some great collaboration in the private sector and, and government. And Gary, you mentioned uh, what you, uh, companies were doing with ventilators, but there's a more opaque um, aspect here to medicines. So where do they come from? What are the components to make them? And it's really quite complex. And good people in the private sector were helping the government figure out what is the supply chain and what, are the, what needs to be supplied? And what are priority drugs that are essential to treat people with coronavirus? So we saw some great collaboration and we've seen some contracts go out to do some advanced manufacturing. Uh, Keith, you mentioned about re-engineering. We have tremendous capability to re-engineer the manufacturing of essential drugs. We can make them end to end fully in the United States and it doesn't have to cost more. We can actually have a smaller environmental footprint. So I think there's great opportunity for a government and private sector collaboration. But I do underscore, this is, these are the generic commodity products. These are like the public utilities, the things you have to have. And it's not gonna be, if I may say, a venture capital come in, make a lot of money and get out. We need sustained investment in these uh, domestic enterprises for those essential drugs to ensure we have uh, what we need when we need it and they're the quality that we expect. So I'll turn it back to you and look forward to a great dialogue. Great, thank you so much, Rosemary. Uh, and we will get, uh, it does, we'll spawn some questions there uh, that you uh, brought up some interesting issues. So um, we're gonna uh, round this up. I'm very excited to have Rob Scott with us. Uh, he's Senior Economist and Director of Trade and Manufacturing Policy Research at the Economic Policy Institute. Uh, for a number of decades, Rob has been really very, very highly influential observer um, and, and an analyst in the areas of international economics, trade, manufacturing policies, uh, particularly as they affect working people. So Rob, if you could bring us home by providing your insights on you know, the new global trade realities and what, we will have to, what will have to happen to create a more resilient manufacturing sector. Thank you, Stephen, I appreciate it. Uh, the, uh... Uh, coronavirus pandemic uh, took, took us by surprise earlier this year, uh, but the disruptions that we're dealing with really reflect uh, decades of, uh, I think, uh, uh, 
a fundamental change in the structure of uh, trade and manufacturing that have left us particularly unprepared uh, for this crisis. And I think this is illustrated in some of the comments we've heard today, uh, particularly from Rosemary, uh, for example, about uh, uh, the supplies of uh, medicines. And I'd like to sort of step back at the what I like to think of as a 30,000 foot level and look at some of the broad trends and some of the policies that we can use to uh, perhaps um, uh, better prepare us for the next time we face this kind of a, of a national crisis. Um, so let me, let me just provide some context. Over the last 20 years, uh, the United States has lost some uh, 91,000 manufacturing plants and uh, roughly 5 million manufacturing jobs. That's roughly 30% uh, of all of US manufacturing capacity. And this reflects uh, really the result of a conscious effort to globalize production. Uh, we, we have offshored much of the production of U.S. manufactured products uh, through both uh, explicit policies, trade policies, such as the negotiation of international trade agreements, uh, uh, pretty much starting with the NAFTA agreement in, in, uh, that, was, uh, uh, that took effect uh, in uh, 1993, and uh, the WTO agreement, which took effect in 1994. Uh, and then, of course, the, the big event was the uh, agreement to bring China into the World Trade Organization uh, in uh, 2001. And, and those agreements really provided a, a, a pathway for uh, U.S. multinationals, who largely drove the effort to outsource production. Uh, and it's resulted, as I said, in this huge loss of, of jobs uh, and factories uh, over this 20-year uh, uh, period. So it has left us exposed and uniquely unprepared uh, for the pandemic because of the uh, extended global supply chains uh, that have developed. Uh, and uh, uh, this process has been facilitated in particular in the United States by I think a number of policy decisions and failures. The most important of these has been what I call the malign neglect of the U.S. dollar. Um, uh, China and other currencies, uh, other countries, uh, managed to uh, encourage outsourcing uh, through a 15-year process of currency manipulation. Uh, this is not just China; it also included Japan. And Korea and about 15 other countries in mostly in Asia but also in Europe uh, and, and, and elsewhere in, in the world. These countries bought up uh, foreign assets uh, such as uh, U.S. Treasury bills and stocks uh, and this bid up the value of the U.S. dollar relative to their currencies by about 25 or 30 percent. This asked, acted like a subsidy to everything that these countries exported to the U.S and a tax on U.S. exports to the rest of the world. So naturally, it became cheaper to source production abroad than uh, to, to build goods here in the United States. Uh, so uh, this is the, pr the single most important cause of the loss of, of jobs and factories uh, from the U.S. manufacturing sector. Uh, it continues today. The dollar has gained about 21% uh, just since 2014. Um, that the recent gain has really been driven by massive private capital inflows to the U.S. So uh, on the currency front, uh, capital flows are the principal problem. And I'll come back to that briefly at the end of my comments, uh, but I want to focus on a couple of other issues here as well. Uh, it's not just uh, uh, currency policy that has uh, set up this situation. Um, we have, uh, as one of, the, one of the other major forces, is, is of course, tax policy. Uh, and when the, uh, the so-called uh, JCTA, or Job Creation and Tax Act, was passed in 2017, one of the things that that act did was create a new lower tax bracket uh, for companies that offshored produc production, particularly of high-tech commodities, where there was a lot of... of uh, uh, high-tech intellectual property involved. And one of the industries that responded most aggressively was the pharmaceutical industry. 
So the U.S. trade deficit uh, in pharmaceuticals more than doubled over the last two years. Uh, that's one of the reasons why so much uh, of our pharmaceutical supplies are produced abroad, uh, much of it in countries, not just in China and India, but also in countries like Ireland. And this has been done strictly for tax reasons. So as a result today, uh, the U.S. has a trade deficit in pharmaceutical products that's bigger than our surplus in aircraft. Our, our aerospace products are our most uh, uh, competitive uh, industry. We have the largest surplus in aerospace, aerospace products of any industry in manufacturing. Uh, but that's more than offset by uh, the trade deficits that we have uh, in pharmaceuticals, in part as a result of tax policies. So uh, I think taxes and currency policies are some of the key problems we face. We've also failed to keep up uh, with other countries, as we mentioned uh, earlier. Uh, other countries are much more aggressive uh, with planning, uh, subsidies for R&D, um, uh, and uh, one particular area that I'm concerned with is support for small and, and medium-sized enterprises. And I think one contrast makes the point uh, quite clear. Um, small and medium-sized enterprises do need support, so-called industrial extension services that help deliver the latest technology uh, to these uh, smaller firms. They're critical in the supply chains and in the manufacturing sector. Um, in Germany, which has a very large and vibrant manufacturing industry, employing about 20% of its labor force, uh, Germany has uh, the, the so-called Fraunhofer Institutes, which have a budget of about 2.8 billion euros and employ some 28,000 scientists and engineers in 74 institutes. Now, by contrast, the United States, which is five times larger, uh, has the uh, Hollings Manufacturing uh, uh, Extension Services Program, which has had a budget of about $140 million a year, uh, which has been targeted for elimination in the 2020 budget of the Trump administration. So Germany, we're about five times bigger uh, than Germany, and yet we have this Hollings Manufacturing Extension Service, which is targeted, which is about uh, five percent of the size of what Germany does. So we just not we're just not keeping up with the competition. So those are three areas I'll emphasize: exchange rates, tax policy, uh, uh, manufacturing extension, and industrial policies. And I think are areas that we really need to emphasize going forward. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Rob. So um, let me go ahead and I'm going to ask you some questions. And uh, as I do, uh, I might direct a questions to one person, but if others have um, an observation they'd like to make, please do. And I'd like to start with Gary. So Rob was talking about offshoring and stuff. Um, I know you're not a policymaker uh, and, and you're, you know, you're actually one of the guys adding value to our economy, um, but I'm interested. Uh, number one is, is reshoring an option for some of our fragile uh, supply chains? Um, you know, how, how, much of a real, how much of reality is reshoring in terms of uh, uh, the auto supply chain, and more specifically to me, how might USM uh, MCA improve auto supply supply chains? Yeah, so Stephen, great question, and we're already looking at our global footprint and locations, and some work is starting to come back to the U.S. Um, you know, some of the things you look at: tax rates, the labor rates, but one of the biggest things that was always not the biggest cost to look at is our freight and distribution or duty aspects of it. And that cost is escalating so fast, it's actually more expensive now for freight and duty than it is the labor savings. Mm -hmm. uh, so part of that's the tax rates, et cetera. So we are starting to move work back into the U.S. Um, and then back into the whole UMC, USMC with Team Canada and Mexico. I think there's more opportunity, uh, but the issue you get into is policies changing between every few years when we lay a footprint down or a plant down, it's a three to five year kind of plan, and then it's there for 25 years because it's very, very expensive to build and put those locations. So we need a consistent policy so we can actually start to bring more things back into our country. And that's the gap, I think, uh, that some of the panelists are talking about is that inconsistency of policy continues to erode, and we can't get stuff back here because we've already made a huge investment in plants overseas. And the cost, you never recover the cost. 
but there is certain stumps starting to come back. Good, and let me turn to Keith. A great paper that you uh, and Mike and Tom wrote. We all agree uh, as one of the things you mentioned in the paper, there's a serious lack of top-down coordination in the federal government. And one of your proposals is the chief manufacturing officer in the White House. And we've had manufacturing czars before. We, you know, we had uh, George W. Bush had an assistant secretary for manufacturing. You know, Barack Obama had Ron Bloom. Donald Trump has Peter Navarro. He has uh, Brian Lenahan right now at the Commerce Department. What makes this position that you're talking about different uh, in, in terms of more coordinative? Well, I think we envision the statutory requirement and, uh, and, and, the, and the manufacturing um, uh, czar or, or executive in the White House would also have responsibility for a national strategic plan and getting input from all of manufacturing. And that plan would provide more certainty about the kinds of policies that the national government would be coordinating and pushing forth over a many year period. So it's different than a new president comes in and appoints someone uh, to be the manufacturing czar. We view it more as a, a statutory structural change that has long lasting uh, effect across administrations. Great, thanks. Um, Rosemary, for you, and this, part of this is a philosophical question, but you know, number one, why did it take a healthcare crisis uh, to kind of bring policymakers around to your perspective? And I guess the next question is, do you believe that we are in the U.S. today in a stronger position or moving toward a stronger position to ensure you know, significant or sufficient production capacity to make a vaccine for COVID-19 or any other disease that might come around? Or what's, what's missing? Where's the gap? I think what we're seeing now is uh, some domestic manufacturers offering solutions to the government and the private sector. And it's often happening behind the scenes. Uh, so uh, at the same time, you know, firms say publicly that they want to maintain their global supply chains. But I think uh, underneath, they really see the fragility of them. I think one of the promise, very promising uh, avenues is the private sector hospitals, which are one of the biggest purchasers of these you know, essential healthcare products, before the uh, pandemic, in 2018, they set up a nonprofit group that basically created a new supply chain uh, for those products that are in shortage. You know, we've had drug shortages in the United States for 20 years of basic life-saving medicines. This was pre-coronavirus. So you had the Mayo Clinic and about 1,200 other hospitals, and now Kaiser Permanente just joined with their 12 million members. They're all chipping in money. And within a year of getting up and running, this group called Civica RX used their purchasing power differently. And they identified uh, suppliers. They're, some are in the US, uh, some are in Europe. Uh, mo they're mostly out of, a not in Asia. And they start producing 20 different essential drugs within a year through contract manufacturing. And they're doing another 20 this year and another 20 for the next three years. So that would bring it to 100 products, serving a very large uh, population of people who need them to survive. And these are coronavirus drugs. And this is the same group that helped supply the strategic national stockpile when it was in very, you know, the, the newspapers didn't mention how severe the shortages were and the rationing going on. So I think it's very promising to see the private sector begin to move in this direction. And I'll tell you, I think they've awakened uh, in some hosp large hospital systems. This doesn't have to be government. These are multi-billion dollar entities. There are some that are buying medical supply chains. My first question, me medical supply companies, my first question to them is, so where do they get their finished product, but where do they get their components from, the material to make? And that now they're beginning to ask that question. We have to go really deep in the supply chain to ensure that we're, we remain on the right track. So that's very promising. And plus we've seen government with the Buy American Executive Order, having the DOD and the VA and the, the stockpile uh, prioritize domestic firms products. So we've started, but boy, we have a long way to go. That's the silver lining of a crisis. It wakes us up to things. We just have to keep the heat on because it is gonna hit again and we wanna be much better prepared. Yeah, no, that's a good point. Thank you. 
Uh, so Rob, um, you know, we've heard Keith and, and Rosemary uh, both talk about certain government policies. This is an issue you, this is a, 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 a challenge you've um, faced a long time in Washington. So a lot of the policies that they're recommending obviously involve a, a, a lot more uh, government activism. What do you say to people who are concerned that a national industrial policy is going to be too politicized, politicians are going to act in their own you know, narrow local interests rather than in the interest of the U.S. manufacturing as a whole? Uh, it's a good chance, I think, here for, for you to kind of clarify what we're really trying to accomplish. Well, in, in fact, I think what we need is a coherent sense of what is in the national interest and a, a strategy for, comp, uh, comp, uh, for comp, uh, achieving that. I, I might take issue here with a, a little bit with Keith's uh, proposal to create a czar uh, for manufacturing in the White House. Uh, I think that's a, uh, it's an interesting proposal, but I think we might need to flesh it out further. And again, if we look at what other countries are doing in this uh, in this area, uh, Japan for decades has man has maintained a uh, ministry of what they used to call trade and industry. I think a uh, different title now, but uh, it's Medi at, at this point. But it's a whole ministry of people uh, who uh, are engaged in the business of developing uh, plans and policies to support uh, manufacturing uh, across the economy. So. Um, and I, I think we need to develop that kind of strategic capability in government. Now, you can have a cabinet secretary uh, if you, if for, that, for that kind of an agency. And it needs to be a different and broader mission than that of the, the U.S. Department of Commerce, I think, which is too involved in, uh, in I think, in, the, in the parochial concerns of, and, and other activities such as managing the census and the Bureau of Economic Analysis, which they also uh, run. We need somebody, uh, we need an agency just focused, I think, on on the needs of, uh, uh, of industry and, and separating uh, the interest of, of, of what's good for the country as a whole, as opposed, frankly, to what's good for um, uh, narrow special interests. I think, for example, to, I don't, don't mean to be too controversial here, but the United States has a, has a national interest in ensuring uh, the security of our supply chains in, in securing the, the supplies of pharmaceuticals. Uh, they're, they're very different, from, for example, from the interests of a Pfizer in maximizing profits. Their profits after tax might be uh, maximized by sourcing uh, primary ingredients in China and India and having those assembled in Ireland. But when a crisis comes, uh, we're better off as a country if those activities take place to a greater extent within the United States. So I think we need a mechanism for distinguishing the national interest from what's it, uh, in the corporate industry, interest, particularly when it comes to trade and the, the resilience of supply chains. Scott, uh, can, I see, can I just jump in on this question? I think it seems to me from our national security, we have had an industrial policy, say for the DOD. You know, we don't make our aircraft carriers, uh, although some of their components might be, Aircraft carriers aren't made in China or elsewhere. And uh, our food commodities, we have a subsidy program to ensure we have sufficient food. So I agree very much with what Rob said. Let's identify those things that are truly strategic assets that if we didn't have them tomorrow or the next day, our country would cease to function. Great, thanks, Rosemary. Uh, so, so Gary, um, you know, uh, some of the uh, panelists have alluded to this. There's a silver lining, uh, which is always hard to see at the start of, of, a, of a crisis. Do you see um, the auto um, sector and uh, industry? And I guess really, this is the lar that's one, if not the largest industry in all of U.S. manufacturing. Is it going to be more resilient uh, in the next three years? Do you see there a silver lining? And is there something missing in public policy that we need to ensure that three years from now, if something like this happens again, uh, you guys are great? Yeah, I think, Stephen, it's a great question. And if I think about unique governments, every state had a different protocol process. Uh, we spent a lot of time meeting with governors and how you could run your plant versus where you couldn't in some aspects. Um, so not having a national standard of how we're going to operate during a virus in a situation create a bunch of one-off policies, right? And if you've got 29 plants spread around the U.S. and Canada was different, 
and us and GM and FCA and all the other industry are all managing different rules, then the industry is just is just going to be a mess on how it goes forward. So for us, it would be what's a standard policy to go through a virus and how you're going to react to it or a, 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 um, a crisis kind of aspect of that. And we didn't have that this time. It wasn't a national program. It was all individual states and even individual counties doing things different. I think us as an industry ourselves, we learned so much. You know, I've been around for a long time, you know, 35 years almost. I've seen just about every crisis. This is the most dramatic. Um, I think the only thing I haven't seen is locusts. We'll see if that takes place sometime. Uh, but we learned a lot, and I think we got a lot of standards, and we're continuing to take lessons learned about potentials next time. But I think having a national process of how we go through this would have helped the entire manufacturing industry and automotive specifically from a supply base uh, and also from an operations standpoint, Steve. Excellent. That's a big deal. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Gary, and thank you for your time with us. So, um, let, we're going to have one or two more questions, and this is for all of you. Um, so I understand Chris Wallace is thrown in the towel. He's not doing a presidential debate again. He, you guys are going to be the moderators of the next presidential debate, and you want the two candidates to talk about manufacturing. I'm going to start with Keith. What do you want to hear from them? And they don't have to be, they're two different parties, so they don't have to be the exact same thing, but what, do you, what, do you, um, what would you like to hear from the two candidates? Well, I actually like the, the framing of the question to be about resilience, right? I mean, I think resilience is a very good theme for a question for the presidential candidates to talk about what they would do to try to promote resilience in the future. Um, so that comes to mind pretty immediately. I also would note that um, I followed the, the major presidential candidates over the last year, since last summer, uh, when there were you know at least 25 Democratic candidates that were uh, throwing their hat in the ring, um, and also two or three other Republicans who wanted to challenge Donald Trump. And I followed what they said on questions important to manufacturing. Uh, what I find interesting is actually uh, what topics none of the candidates addressed over the last year that were pretty important. One relates to the defense industrial base. No candidates have talked about that. And the candidates haven't really talked about smart manufacturing either. So I would ask them about resilience, but I might also prod them a little bit about our defense industrial base, our weaknesses and how to shore that up. Um, because I think it also might set a model for what we need to see in the private sector. Thank you. Rosemary. I would ask the, uh, the question, uh, what is the policy that's been most detrimental to manufacturing in the United States. And I would ask that question just to see their understanding of policy in relation to this subject. And ask them what do they think would be the most strategic uh, intervention that uh, the US government should undertake to in ensure we have a resilient manufacturing base for um, essential things that we need for our country to function. Good, thank you. So Rob would be an excellent moderator at a presidential debate. <laughs> Rob, what would you ask? And you, have, you only have a limited number of, uh, of minutes here, so. <laughs> Thanks, I appreciate it. I, I don't know why you think I qualify, but, but uh, I, I really would uh, enjoy the opportunity to ask what are the top three things each of these candidates would do uh, to rebuild American manufacturing? And uh, let it uh, let it go to that. And I, I think I'd follow up about uh, issues like tax policy, exchange rates, and investments in uh, infrastructure and clean energy. Uh, to, you know, just to prod them uh, in what I think are useful directions. Good. Well, listen, I have one more question, and this is uh, for Rob, but the others can answer as well. Um, which policies? You, 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 manufacturing resilience to me depends as much on people as anything else. What are the policies that we need to help us build capacity for skilled labor needed for supply the value chains and for the future of manufacturing well I, i'll give you a two-part answer to that uh, Stephen. thanks um I, clearly we need to invest more in training and workforce development uh, other countries uh, invest much more than we do uh for example in, in school to work transition and also, this, I think this is part of the broader question of having a broad and effective safety net. Uh, the the uh, 
Germany and some of the other nor Northern European countries have so-called flex security systems where workers get uh, income support for up to two years and, and the government helps invest in new job creation. I think this is all part of an effective uh, job training uh, a, a program. So to, to me, those are some of the, uh, the, the key missing elements. The other aspect, I think, uh, and, and we haven't talked, touched on this at all, but there is a role to play for organized labor. Uh, uh, unions used to play a much larger role in training, especially in the skilled trades, uh, but union uh, membership has been decimated in the last uh, uh, 30 years in this country. And I think that is one of the things that uh, uh, some of the progressive Democrats uh, would like to see is a much stronger uh, labor movement uh, supported, for example, by the so-called PRO Act that has been approved by uh, the House of Representatives, a number of measures to support a development of labor rights. Keith, anything on this? Well, I would add uh, immigration policy is also important. Um, we, um, in our paper, we mentioned that um, we're wary about the federal government restricting visa programs designed to ramp up skilled labor to meet the needs of manufacturers. Even a pause in such visas creates business uncertainty and might increase the likelihood of permanent offshoring. So um, I would not rule out um, uh, looking at immigration policy as well when we're looking for um, skilled labor in the future. Thanks, and Rosemary, if, if you have any thoughts on this? And uh, uh, sure. Uh uh, in uh, recent months, we're hearing from domestic manufacturers who are beginning to ramp up and expand production. And the resumes that they're getting are off the charts. So we have a tremendous untapped uh, skill base here. that's just not being used. And that's a loss of our uh, human capital. So what, what's needed is demand for domestic production for these people to get back to work to run manufacturing plants and produce great product. Excellent. Well, the, thank you very much, uh, Keith, Rob, Rosemary, Gary. Thank you very, very much. Uh, thanks to the Hudson Institute. Thanks for, uh, to the Manufacturing Policy Initiative uh, at uh, in, um, Indiana University. We're delighted to have had this session and hopefully, hopefully we'll make a dent. So appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much.